Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are, welcome to the community live stream. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow, Senior Developer Evangelist, been here for about 10 years and happy to be here once again. This is Monday, July 13th, 2020, and our topic today is the Array Util Script Include. There's some interesting stuff in here that I recently discovered and wanted to go over. I thought I knew this 12 years ago, really, but there's always a surprise. Never hurts to go back and look at this. Good morning to everyone who's checking in. Good morning, Hitesh Swapnil, Mark, Jasmeet. Great to see everybody joining. I saw you queued up in the beginning. It's like, wow, we've got a good group waiting at the door. Well, the doors are flung wide open and let's share the knowledge of Array Util today. If you don't remember, we do this live on YouTube at 2 p.m. UTC on Mondays and Thursdays. This is Monday the 13th. And uh, oh, quick note, if you've got something deeper about Array Util or you've got something other than Array Util, please feel free to go over and share that on the community at community.servicenow.com. That's our topic today. I know sometimes people try and get a, a question in the chat that's a little off topic about training or certifications or something. Great questions, I love them all. Really, we wanna stay focused on this topic, so let's, let's keep it on this topic and take those questions over to the community that you see behind me, because that's the inspiration for a lot of these episodes. Now, most of these episodes are your emails and that kind of thing. Oh, wow, everybody's checking in. Thank you for joining today. Uh, back to YouTube, you know what to do. Share, like, subscribe, notifications, that whole thing. You can go back into the archive on the ServiceNow community channel and find all of the previous episodes that we've done on this. The topical ones start about mid-April 2020, and before that it was uh, sort of a scatter of, let me go through the community, see what I can find, and give you my thoughts on those questions. So. The idea of this show is to dig deep, give you the thought process uh, inspired by the community so that you can take the skills of engineering and thinking and the whole platform in general and apply those to your job to be a more effective developer and administrator. So with that in mind, let's go on. You can also find this on Twitch over at twitch.tv slash now community. Very happy to be over there as well. If you haven't done so already, please go over and check out the developer portal at developer.servicenow.com. Got to give the bell in there. And uh, free personal developer instance. We are only a couple of weeks away from the Paris release. Early access on the Paris release comes to the developers first. So go over and get your free developer instance and you can check out the Paris release before well, kind of get that exclusive thing. When you're done with that, you turn around and register. Well, you can register now if you want for Tech Now episode 77 over at TN77Reg, bit.ly slash TN77Reg, where I will cover with Craig and Jeremy all of the platform features. It's not gonna get into CSM or HR, ITSM or ITBM or any of the other acronyms we've got floating around there. It's all about the platform. What's new with APIs, what's new with tables, what's new with security, what's new with ATF, those core platform things that you and I use on a daily basis, that's what you can get into over there. Register for that and I will share all of that information with you in a couple of Tuesdays. It's coming up quick. I'm gonna rehearse one more time, go through those notes this afternoon. The uh, other thing we want you to take a look at, let's bring that back and this back, there we are, is meetups. We have developer meetups happening virtually all over the place. Let's see what's on the agenda for this week. These aren't in any order. I don't know why meetup doesn't sort these chronologically. Kind of confusing. July 30th, we've got uh, Minneapolis. August 4th is Madison. July 20th, coming up soon, is Boston. I'm gonna look into these. The 16th, in just a few days, is Milano. So there isn't one near you. There's our virtual, so you can go to them anyway. <laughs> Sign up for those meetups over at meetup.com. And the URL for that was, do I have it? I do. Meetup.com slash pro slash service now dev program. We'd love to see you there. I'm trying to attend as many as possible, time zone permitting, of course. So good morning. Wow, there's so many names up there. Steve is here and Alan and James. And, Wow, thank you. Good audience today, appreciate it. That's what gets me up in the morning. <laughs> that and learning about a new script include. 
<laughs> Let's continue on. I am going to uh, quickly mention that there is some JavaScript in here. Very quick, short little examples. If you want to know more about JavaScript or some of this doesn't make sense, like what's an object? What's he doing with that array? I'm not familiar with arrays. Why would we want to use arrays? This is the series for you. It has now been live for one year and one day. It was published July 12th to 2019. And thank you for everybody who is watching and more so to those that are recommending. That, uh, you know, when you get a, uh, a reference from a peer, that's, that's gold to me. That just blows my mind. And thank you very much. I've heard a number of you at meetups and, and on your blog saying, hey, go watch this JavaScript series. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be able to put this together. I've got more ideas on similar content coming up in the future. So stick around. I'm not done yet. The purple shirt, of course, means we're doing an API adventure today. I forgot to mention that because I just noticed the green shirt up there. That's Thursday. That's for a, uh, a technical deep dive. Anyway, the scripts that I do have for you today can be found on the bit.ly link you see here, bit.ly slash sn cls. For those code snippets, take them, run them in scripts background or explore or wherever you want and experiment. Learn. That's how we learn, right? You take a small, simple example and you tweak it a little bit and go, what happens if I do this? What happens if I pass a third argument to this function? What happens if I try adding more stuff in? What if I put invalid data in? What happens? That's the fun part, right? That's where we learn. Oh, let's continue on back to my developer instance, which I got from developer.servicenow.com. Okay, <laughs> gotta keep doing that. And I wanna make sure I've got my notes up here. Where's my cursor? There it is. Notes, so I get these in order for you the way that I had intended. So I have the document page from docs.servicenow.com up here for ArrayUtil. You can see this is global. And if I look in script includes, which is under system definition, I am flipping around to too many cursors and screens and whatnot with my hands. And I look for ArrayUtil. This is a standard baseline. Some people will say out of the box. I'm trying to get myself off of that term because there is no box. It's cloud software. Come on. And it says this is global and it's open to all application scopes. This was not open to all application scopes at one time. It was only available to global apps. So that's changed. I don't, I don't recall when it was. I suppose we could find out if there's been any recent updates by doing a show XML, woo, there's the script in here. And if we look at sys updated on 2016. Okay, so it was probably shortly after we came out with scoped apps. ArrayUtil has a number of functions in here. Let me open that up to the full screen mode. Make it just a little bit bigger for you. So we can do that. And we can even collapse this so we can see some of this code. We have contains, and I'll go through these one at a, a time. Index of, ensure array, concat, convert array, diff, and intersect, and I believe the last one is union. Oh, and unique. I use unique all the time. Okay, I'll go through these one at a time. It's not that long. These are very handy. If you've used some strings before and you've done some manipulations like index of, some of this will seem natural. Tell me which list this element is in. And you know, I was just thinking I had an exercise this weekend. I should have been using index of, but it became a time issue because I had lots and lots of records to search through, so I'm not going to use it. Let's take a look at the, in, the array util page. It has some snippets on it, okay? And it also has some that do not, like convert array doesn't have a code sample. It just says convert an object to array. Not the most useful thing in my opinion. So that's why I wanted to dig in a little deeper and experiment with this and explain to you what I found or what I didn't find in some cases. Diff, code example. Ensure array, no code example. Like, I'm working with them. Okay, Doc's team is getting here. <laughs> I usually extend and add sort. Oh, sort is, well, sort is built into JavaScript. Sort is, is a native array utility. You often want to declare your own function for the uh, sorting algorithm. Do you want ascending? Do you want descending? Do you want to sort by a certain key? That if you've got objects, you're going to need to do that. So you're welcome to extend it. I really haven't found much of a need for it myself, but I'm open to use cases to understand. Let's go back to my instance. 
I am going to go to scripts background and I have some pre-written scripts here to help demonstrate what these are all about. Let's start with concat. Okay. I declare the array util. I instantiate the object with new. Very common. How do you know when to use new and when you don't? Well, if the script includes starts with prototype up here, then you need a new. If it doesn't, if it's just a bunch of functions already labeled out, if it says array util dot something, array util dot something, you can just call those. You don't need to instantiate. In fact, it'll break if you do. And if you forget the new keyword, it will break. I also put global on here because I want to forcibly say this is a global, uh, a global script include because my scope may be something other than global. And I will prove that down here in the uh, in the in the picker in the scope picker on that. It doesn't matter if it already is global. So quick background: we've got scoped applications. This is a way to protect applications from other applications. Global was the original architecture until we came out with scoped applications about 2015. All applications could interact, could write records, delete records from any other table. And we started coming out with apps like HR and said, oh, oh, no, no, HR needs to be protected. We also needed a mechanism to be able to allow ISPs or partners to create applications on the store that were safe to install that didn't conflict with other applications that were already there. So we came up with this scope. You think of it as a namespace in a certain sense. It's not exactly a namespace. So. I have declared a new object called AU, short for array util. I've got two arrays here, A, B, C, D, and C, D, E. It's simply going to glue those two together. That's what concat does. Let's go prove that that works. That's what my GS info says. Show me the output of A plus, A1 plus A2 is what it basically says. Paste that in there and run it, and I get A, B, C, C, D, E. See that? Not too difficult. That's exactly what I expected. ABC plus CDE. It didn't do any uniqueness. We've got another function for that. Didn't do any sorting. If I screw these up, all it's doing is gluing these together. So you can see how having unique little utilities is very handy to be able to stitch these things together later on. So. Looking for questions. Do you play games with your Canvas API? Uh, make video job. You, you have to pay for the meter on the store. Can't tell you about the store, really. Good question for the community. I am not a store specialist. Maybe uh, Pretty can answer that one. Let's go on to the next one. The oh, second example of concat. So this is a very simple array of strings. I wanted to know, will it work on objects? And I created a3, which has two objects, name and age, one for Chuck, one for Tom, and then I've got another array down here, one for Linda, one for Amit, and let's see if this will work. I'm still doing my concat down here, but I've surrounded it by JSON stringify, because if I just said, hey, show me what it is, because this is an object, like, yeah, nice, that doesn't tell me anything. I want to introspect what's in that object. So I put it into JSON and stringify and put that in the gs.info. So I've got a couple of levels going on here. But the end result is, let's put that in, paste and run, and the answer is yes, it does concat arrays of objects. Not just strings, not just numbers, it will do objects. I haven't tested that for all these methods. I invite you to try it if you like. So I've got Chuck, Tom, Linda, Amit. Everybody's got their properties. Everybody's in the happy array. It's a good time. Not too tough to figure out what concat does. Let's go on to the next one. These are not in alphabetical order. I did go to a Phoenix developer meetup one time, and the guy presenting said, it helps if you put these in alphabetic order in your script include. I don't generally follow that. I, I, I probably should, but I, I have more, mine more in a logical order, like my more complex logic is at the top and the simpler ones are at the bottom, or they're grouped together so that these three that work together are near each other so that I'm not jumping around. Your style guide, your thing. If you find alphabetic is easier for documentation purposes, good on you. 
Let's continue on with the next example, which these are alphabetic contains. Okay, again, instantiate the object. Here's an array, A, B, C. I want to know if A, U, if A1 contains a B and if A1 contains X. Simply saying, does this thing exist in the array? Very easy to figure out. It probably is going to say true for B and false for X, and of course we do. Does A1 contain B? Yes, it does. We're humans, we can see that. You want to try, you want to see if it uh, works with objects again? I'm curious. I don't know the answer to this. I didn't try it. Let's create an array. In fact, let's do it over here. Let's do it over here. It's easier to see. We'll take this script. Uh, yeah, we'll take this script. It'll be a better starting point. Paste it there. Create a new array of objects. Let's create some objects real quick. Object one. In fact, we could probably copy it from here. Aha, copy and paste to the rescue. Our old friend. Let's get rid of that, paste that in. And now, what would you say? B.name? I'm not sure what you're ask what you would ask for. Hmm. Maybe it would help if we look at the script include and see if contains. It simply says if a1 equals equals element. I think you'd have to pass in an entire object. Well, let's find out if it contains. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see if we can pass in the entire object for Tom and 54 and say, does it contain that? We're going to find out if we can make this work. If you pass it an entire object, will it say it contains it? It says false. Okay, so clearly that equals equals isn't doing it for us. The element is Tries to convert it to an array. The array is fine. Yep. Um, I suspect it's it's probably not object savvy at this point. All right, that didn't work. But we, again, experiment. Try it out. If you have questions, I'm gonna close that one without saving it. Let's go on to it contains convert array. This one threw me for a little bit because I wasn't quite sure the difference between that and where's my docs? Docs. Docs. There we are. This is also alphabetic, so you can see why I'm doing it this way. Convert array. Convert an object to an array. And I thought, well, if I pass it this array with name and age and whatnot, it'll convert it to some kind of array. No, that's not what it does. <laughs> that's, that's what I thought, and my experiments did not work. It converts a Java array to a JavaScript array. And I went, well, what's the difference between this and the J2JS script include that we have? Hmm. Okay. Don't know. I don't have a good answer for you for that. Common exposure to Java arrays is on the table utils script include. If you want to say, tell me all the tables that are extended from task, or tell me all the tables that are in, what's the baseline of this? There's a lot of utils. We'll do table utils in another time, I think. But uh, we could say, get all the table extensions from table utils. Then I declare AU again and convert it to an array. So you're saying, well, gee, Chuck, what is going to happen if I just do this and a GS info to get this? And it's very deceptive. I don't like the way this is represented. If I said GS info, ext, you go, well, it's an array, right? If table you if get all extensions is returning an array, it will look like an array. And it goes, uh, oh, table utils is private to global. Aha, uh -huh, probably because it involves Java objects. And it prints out this array. But notice, this is not the same notation as a JavaScript array. The clue that this is a Java array is those brackets and no quotes. If I did another, another array, like var array equals, let's put in Chuck Amit Druv. Okay, with just some names and say gs.info array. Watch the difference in the way these are displayed. This is just comma separated values. This has a square brackets around it and spaces in it. It's different representation. If you see that, alerts should be going off because you're not going to be able to run your standard for loop around this thing. It is 
going to require a convert array. Convert that Java array or Java object to a JavaScript array. Then I could use something like index of, sort of putting two exercises together to say, where is incident? Because without that, I can't do it. Let me take a look at this, paste that in there just to show you what it's going to do when it runs. It says 10. And if we count on our other one, we should have left our GS info up there. Let's do this. GS.info ext, run it. 0, 1, 2, 3, that's a long one, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep, there's incident out of 10. Remember, it starts at 0, so it's the 11th element. That's where the index is. And index is obviously very handy. But if I tried using index of on this thing natively, it's a gs.info au.index of ext incident, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to say undefined because it's not an array. You can't do that here. So just keep your eye out for those square bracket things. If things are a little wonky with arrays, make sure you've got the right type. And one of the most common operators I use when things are just not what I expect, is type of. And it will say, this is an array. This is an integer, a number. Let's do type of on both of these. Just to give you an example, this is an object. You go, well, OK. And it will say object for arrays a lot of times, too. If I say ext down here, oop, that's an array. And if I say conversion is gs.info type of conv, note that it says object also. So this isn't a conclusive way to determine, is this a string? Is it a Java array? Is it? But uh, if you do the GS info on the elements of that, and it comes back with the square brackets, you know you've got something. So just one of those idiosyncrasies about us having a Java platform and exposing data up to JavaScript. You may get caught by that. and that's where convert array comes in handy. Test of the variable is an array before or after. I just showed that. Oh, even better. Let's do this. Instance of is another way to do this. Okay, you could say, is it an instance of glide record? And it will say, yeah, this is a glide record or not. Because when you instantiate it, when you have that, that piece of it, I could say, is it an array? Is it an array? Watch what happens. If I say ext, getting that back from table utils, and say, are you an array? It says, no, I'm not an array. It's not a JavaScript array. But that's another way. Better than type of, instance of will also tell you information. Returns a true or a false. I use this a lot to determine if something coming into a script include, like if I pass uh, something into um, here table utils task, for example. When I instantiate an object, it runs that um, where is it? Sorry to flip back and forth so much. I lost pride. It passes that to the initialize function. That's what gets run once when you do an instantiation. And I have instance of it there to go, are you sending me a string? Then it's probably a sysid. Are you sending me the instance of a glide record? Then I don't need the sysid. I've already got the record. And I can make do with what type of information. It makes the scripting code a little more flexible to say, sometimes I need to pass a sysid. Sometimes I need to pass a glide record. And you figure out the rest. That's easy. That's easy. So that's a little insight into Java arrays versus JavaScript arrays. Let's take a look at our next example. We're cruising through these. Diff, one of the most common ones that I've seen, I think, on the community and use it a lot. You can take the difference between two arrays. Very handy. I would recommend sorting your arrays first. It's not, not required but it helps in the uh, readability output. So let's do this all in one step. I'm not going to instantiate it first and then call diff. Oops, I'm not going to do that either. But I can chain these two together and say, instantiate it and run diff on array one and a two. And what it will do is, got ABC, I've got CDE, 
The difference between those is A and B. Why is it A and B? Because, and not E, it's saying, let's read the docs, just so I get this right, I don't want to misstate it. Find the difference between two or more arrays. Any number of arrays can be provided as parameters. It says returns an array of items from array A that were not found in either B or C. So it's not taking the union, it's not taking the intersection, it's not taking, it's taking the difference. It says, here's A, tell me about what's not in these other ones. What's unique about A that's not in these other ones? Because E is not in A, so it really doesn't care. It only cares about B and C in my example. So we can see, or A and B, excuse me, it says, yep, a is not in array 2, B is not in array 2, C is, so that's a false, D is not in A, and E is not in E. So handy, a lot of times, I, I think I was thinking about gs.diff, not a, uh, array util.diff. Pardon me. Array diffs aren't that common, but handy to know. And note that it can take more than one parameter, two or more arrays. I could put out an array C, array D, and say, all right, I've got these data elements. Think about importing data from another system, and you want to find out what's unique about this first one that hasn't already been seen in these other ones. Might want to do that. A lot of times I deal with arrays, it's on uh, data import types of issues. They just seem to be modifying a lot more data that way. Let's go on to the next one. In index of, we already took a quick look at this, but here is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I declare my array util, and I say, where is C and where is Z? It's going to say C is 0, 1, 2, Z is, ah, what is Z? Well, if you were to do an index of on a string and to look for the position of something that wasn't found, index of from the standard JavaScript library will return a minus 1. It says it's not found. Can't return a 0 because that's the start of the string. So it has to return something that's outside the range of 0 to n, that would be minus one. And if I look at the second parameter, ooh, there is a third argument that comes into index of, and that is a start index. Where would you like to start looking? You may have, let's say you again, we're importing data, and they all have a prefix of like INF, for example. And you really don't care. You're looking for maybe an F somewhere past that. You can say start counting from position 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, and look for capital F at that point. So let's do that as an example. First we'll do the simple one to say, what is the position? I went right past my browser somehow. Go here, look for the position. What did I say? 2 and minus 1? 2 and minus 1. Good. We got what we expect. Let's throw in the other examples. Back to the editor, not the finder. Come on, stop it, finder. Finder just wants to be special today. Remember me? <laughs> Don't forget, finder's here. Hey, let's do it again. I'm not gonna learn to skip over that. Let's just fix that one more time. There, Whew. got it. This says start at two, zero, one, two, and find a D, and then find a D at six, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Will it find a D after six? Probably not, unless I put one in, and it says, First one is at three, which makes sense. This is from the beginning, not from your start index. That way you don't have to do any special arithmetic to go, well, it said it was two and I started at four, so does that make it really six? Your array is your array is your array. It, that didn't change. As I found the first one at three, zero, one, two, three, and six at minus one. I said, well, if I start counting at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's nothing after that. So unless I put Another D out here, that second one is going to say minus one. Okay, if I make that an R, an R, and run it, it will go back to minus one. There's no Ds out here. So again, handy stuff if you want to find the index of something. Haven't tested on objects, don't suspect it'll work. Uh, perfect use cases for new members in a watch list or create events. Absolutely, check those societies. See if the, the society is found in there anywhere, and if it comes back as minus one, then you can add it. Love the use case. As in a list field, like a watch list, is just a comma-separated set of societies. It references the records 
in the table pointed to by the list field. What I'm talking about is on my instance, let's go back here, incident is a good place to look at a watch list. Thank you very much, Brian. Or Byron, excuse me. I know people, it'll, you probably get that all the time, and I want to be apologetic. I, there were, when I was growing up, there were twins in high school named Byron and Brian. I could tell the difference. So the watch list field, as you're probably already aware, is for some reason not on here. Okay. Oh, there it is. Watch list is down here. And right click show. It says I am it's like a reference field, but it can hold multiple sysIDs. So it's a glide list that points to sys user and the values in there are going to be comma separated values for our able tutor, Beth Anglin, Chuck Tomasi, system administrator. You get the idea. It'll just be and you could say, do I see this person in here? If it comes back with minus one, then add them to it. Okay. Very easy to do. And you can add people through script to the watch list. Nice use case. Thank you. That was very helpful. Next one, intersect. Got two arrays again, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and C, H, U, C, K. <laughs> Have you threw in a couple duplicates in there? What is the intersection of A1 and A2? What do these two have in common? Now look at the docs page, intersect. Oh, I missed ensure array. There's no script for ensure array because it also says returns an array from an object. Did I have a script for that? I thought I did. I do not. Unique, unique, unique. Okay. Object, the object for which the created. I can't find any use for this. It's not referenced anywhere in the docs, which is frustrating. I mean, it's not referenced anywhere in the baseline script. So I'm not sure what ensure array is supposed to do that convert array or JS, J to JS don't already do. The description is similar to convert array. No out of box examples that I can find. Don't know. If anybody's got a use case or understands what this is for, please let me know. Maybe you've got some plugins turned on that I don't. So let's go to the next one. We did index of, index of with multiple elements. Intersect says, what do these have in common? I made a little bigger example than the one that's available there. These are very similar to the examples that are on the docs page, but hey, if you use my repo, you don't have to type them in, right? says what they have in common is C and H, and that would be entirely true. Notice that it only lists it one. It's because there is, if you look closely, go back to that script include. I went, why doesn't it say C twice? Hmm. If you look at intersect, do, 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 which I think is way down here, it has, at the end, it calls its own unique function. So instead of saying C and H and C, it goes, why am I telling you what they have in common twice? Let's make this unique, which jumps a little bit ahead. But that's what it does. It takes out duplicates. It deduplicates your array. That's what unique does. So that makes total sense. C and H or intersect. Where are we on the script list? Oh, we're almost done. Union puts them together says, what do they all have? If I want to take multiple arrays and say, all right, keep finding out what the, this is. I want the whole data set. Some is in this record, some is in that record, some is in that record. But overall, what does the whole data set look like? We can do that. I feel like I'm back in like fifth grade math where we were learning about Venn diagrams and unions and intersections. Same concept. There's a reason computer science and mathematics departments are usually linked together. Okay. This says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, U, C, K. Okay, not sorted. It is uniqued, right? Because I have this list and this list and it says, well, I already saw C and I already saw H, but take one, A, B, C, a, B, I don't know how I came up with that order. It's probably just sticking them into this list at some point. So, <laughs> intersect, very useful. Ensure array, looks like it basically guarantees that the variable is an array, i.e. null and undefined are turned into empty array. Oh, shall we have some fun with that? Let's try. So var, 
a1 equals nothing far. Let's do our au equals new uh, global dot array util. Easy enough. gs.info au dot ensure array a1. See what it says. Nothing. Okay. Ensure array a2. A2 is not defined, so I can't use it, which it technically is if I say undefined, right? Wouldn't it say undefined? Well, maybe if I went A2, this is undefined. It has no, okay, nothing. Let's do a type of here. You know, let's save the answer. Bar my A2 equals AU dot ensure array A2. Curious where you found that information too. Or if you did some experimentation. Find out. A2 and let's say gs.info for earlier uh, instance of A2. You got to do this right. A2 instance of array. Uh, bed statement, I'm missing a semicolon somewhere. Do I have a colon instead? Line seven. This is where I wish I had line numbers. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, too many brackets, too many parentheses. Undefined and false. Okay, so type of is undefined, and this is false. Oh, but I should have my A2 out here. Wah, wah. Find out what my A2 is. We already know A2 is undefined and it's not an array. And now it's an object and true. It is an array. Cool. Not sure when you would use that, but somebody's got an imagination for a use case to ensure that some thing coming back, maybe. So what would be the difference of that? And let's try convert array. Convert array. Undefined and false. Okay. Interesting. We need to improve the docs really bad on that page. Let's go back. Thank you very much, Byron. We all learn together. That's why this is the community live stream. <laughs> it, it works sometimes. Oh, and look at this. We even have community spelled out in here. Final one is unique. You can see I've got the letter C in here once, twice, three. We've got M in here a couple of times. Unique is simply going to isolate those duplications. I believe it does this in place where we get H A C O M U N T Y. Feels like it's doing it in reverse order, but I'm not sure. Um, watch out for operations not necessarily unique well yeah it is it's got a nested loop in here so it's going through both arrays if you have lots of data or lots of arrays or you're doing this thousands and thousands of times this can get cpu intensive i discovered this last weekend i was putting together a small example of retrieving data from a rest api and i said hey this works pretty well with 25 records Let's extend it out to 800 records. And it timed out. My flow stopped. It was too long. I said, where's it spending all its time? It's not in retrieving the records. It's not even in creating a new glide record. It was in that processing that it had to do on each record. Because if I took that out and said, just retrieve a record and go uh, ret retrieve through the REST API, and for each one of those, go create a glide record of what you saw. Not a log statement, but just a separate glide record and a separate table. And it would do about 20 of those records a second. When I started throwing in this interstitial processing between each record, that slowed down to one record every two or three seconds. That's a 10x difference because I'm going through one of these index of operations is exactly what I was doing. I was saying, does this string appear, you know, does this appear in this array somewhere? And it just went, it, it just kind of blew up. So. Be careful when you start sticking in this, this interstitial processing. It can really, really hamper your operations. Okay. And now I just thought of a different way that I could approach that problem. <laughs> Sometimes not thinking about it is a good way to think about it.
<laughs> and that takes care of it. I think we're that's the end of our examples. I will have the code posted up to make sure there's nothing else out there. No, nope. no, nope. we've got we got through concat. I've got my concat objects, contains diff, index of both operations. That's array util. Lots of useful stuff in there. If you're dealing with arrays, which are very, very powerful things, if you haven't already done them, you can pass a whole data set, similar uh, data type, whether it's objects, integers, strings, you name it. You can make a list of these things and pass them and say, here, function, here's a whole bunch of things you can work on. Involve array utils when you can and say, where is this element in there? But again, be careful because Looping and nested loops in these things can slow it down, depending. Make sure your operation is scalable. That takes care of it. I hope you find a good use for array utils. I am going to do that. Wish you a fond week. Join me this Thursday, again, 2 p.m. UTC, whatever that happens to be in your neighborhood. It's currently 6, no, 7 a.m. Pacific time in the U.S., 10 a.m., Eastern time in the US, probably 7.30 p.m. IST, you got the idea. 2 p.m. UTC. This Thursday, I will be doing another inspired uh, question from a community member saying, I want to put some reminders on approval. So we're going to do approval reminders on Thursday. Hope you can join me for that. Very popular subject, comes up all the time on the community. We've had a number of I'll just say evolutionary answers as we've gone through the history. I used to do this with a scheduled job. There's better ways to do it now. Please don't use scheduled jobs for this stuff anymore. <laughs> it's not the right answer for you know, creative, creativity and maintainability and speed. Okay. Join me for that. Until then, I will see you again real soon. Take care. Bye.